really distinguish yourself as you served our nation. You leave a formidable legacy and a strong foundation on which to build the South Africa that we want. It was a great joy for me, and indeed, I think, for Minister Lamini Zuma, in the manner in which we continued to work with her. And we worked with her during the trying times of COVID as we convened forum after forum, meeting after meeting, and she was always there making her inputs, very positive suggestions, and never did I hear her raise a complaint without accompanying that issue she was raising with a solution. So she was solution-oriented, and I truly honor and thank her. It is my hope that this House will continue to have that can do and very positive spirit of working together with us as government. It is my hope that this House will also continue to advance the empowerment of women and the achievement of gender equality within this institution. She certainly distinguished herself in that way as well, as she sought to advance the interests of women. We should be inspired by our country's many pioneering women leaders, such as Hosi Mwamwita Wagalui, whose determined struggle against gender discrimination is truly a testament to the obstacles that women must conquer to secure their dignity and what is rightfully theirs. I have been enjoying reading the book about Hosi Mwamwita's journey, and it's a very inspiring journey indeed. I say so because it is important that her type of story and struggle for dignity and recognition as a woman should be known and to be spread so that all of us as South Africans should be more and more aware about the role that women play in our society. Her story confirms that we are a democratic and empowering society. The heroic contributions of women leaders should not be relegated to fireside stories or to the fading culture of oral history. Women need to be at the center of everything that we do. Development, leadership, governance, economy, you name it, everything. This is what South Africa should be all about. Women's emancipation and empowerment should remain one of the priority programs of this House. We should approach the next reconstitution of the House with the assurance that women representation will increase and significantly so. Honorable members, my traditional leaders, you take office at a time when our country is facing many challenges. These include poverty, unemployment, inequality, the rising cost of living, the impact of COVID-19, and devastating floods and the scourge of gender-based violence and femicide. Earlier we were talking with Minister Tlamini Zuma about the horrific floods that are devastating many parts of our country. And the devastation is more to be felt in our rural areas where many of our people live, where the infrastructure is not that well geared to sustain the type of floods that we are having. While these challenges may at times appear insurmountable and overwhelming, we must take to heart the Guinean proverb which says, 
No matter how long the winters, spring is sure to follow. We see this house as an important platform to address these challenges that I've touched on now and into the future. And I expect <clears throat> that when we shall meet again, when I will come back to this house for the full debate, these challenges will be laid to bear and we will be able to debate them with a view of deciphering solutions for all these challenges. We pledge to work with you and support you in leading national recovery and reconstruction and to build a South Africa that leaves no one behind. Over the years, <clears throat> I've greatly appreciated and benefited from the wise counsel that I've often received from this house. I'm convinced that if we work together, we act boldly and decisively, we will be able to resolve our challenges as we did many times in the past. Chairperson of the House, your opening and welcoming remarks in my view already, do position this house as a trusted forum for us to be able to work together with. Your reference to addressing our solutions through what we have put together as a model, a method of the district development model already tells me that this house has a disposition to work with us. <clears throat> As we reflect on what we need to move forward together, we recall the words of the great Pan-Africanist and son of the soil, Anton Mziwake Lembede, who said, we have to go out as apostles to preach the new gospel of Africanism and to hasten and bring about the birth of a new nation. Such minor insignificant differences, he said, of languages, of customs, etc., will not hinder or stop our irre irreversible onward search to the African spirit. As representatives and leaders within our communities, it is up to us to carry with us that African spirit as we pursue an inclusive and just society. In a period of challenges, in a period of danger, in a period of what others may see as insurmountable, obstacles. That is when we close ranks. That is when we hold each other's hands and work together. That is precisely what Anton Muziwake Lembede was saying, one of the illustrious leaders of our country who worked with other giants of our movement like Nelson Mandela, Walter Sulu, and O. R. Tambo. I do hope and wish that that is the spirit that we will all have as we address the challenges that face us. I wish to add my voice to the call for the formalization and strengthening of the functioning of a King's and Queen's Forum that has been mooted. We see it as an important platform to tap into the collective wisdom of our majesties. The forum will help us to address issues such as disputes, around traditional leadership, gender-based violence, and other social ills such as initiation, challenges, and many others. The forum will help us to document the history of our nation and the role of traditional leaders in our struggle 
and development as a nation. I do wish and long for a consolidated, fully consolidated, historical account of how our forebears, our kings and queens, deported themselves as they fought against the colonial invaders and many who fought gallantly. Their stories have not really been told. You come across them in snippets and snippets here. That, those stories need to be consolidated and perhaps this forum will help us do just that so that we too as a nation on a collective basis can regale in the glorious historical account of our country so that our history should not continue to be told to our children and those who will follow by the colonial writers, by those who just came to observe and sometimes either as tourists or with guns in their hands or with Bibles in their hands. The history of our country needs to be told by us. And I long for that day, so I hope Hoshi Mukwen, from a controversial point of view, that that will be done <clears throat> one day. In the 2023 State of the Nation Address, we emphasize the importance of forging a consensus amongst stakeholders amongst all sectors of our society to rebuild our economy and address the developmental needs of our communities. Our local economic development efforts will no doubt be enhanced by the work that the institution of traditional and Khoisan leadership has come up with in the form of the Invest Rural Master Plan. We welcome the plan's focus on converting rural development challenges into investable opportunities, covering such critical areas as infrastructure development, agriculture, service delivery, financial inclusion, and rural enterprise development. I recall the late Nkosi Sipomatlangu sharing a copy of the master plan with me. He said we should use it as a blueprint for partnering to deepen socioeconomic development in rural communities. May Ngozi Matlangu's soul and spirit continue to rest in peace and in honor of his memory, may we ensure that we make effective rural development a reality. One of the resolutions taken at the local government summit last year was that the master plan should be shared with all municipalities so that it can inform their plans such as uh, such an approach should complement and reinforce the district development model. We will need the council of traditional leaders in identifying the endowments competitive advantages and potential industrial opportunities of each of the localities with traditional leadership. These are critical building blocks in building resilient, safe, sustainable, prosperous, cohesive, connected and climate smart communities. The skilling of our people is critical. In doing so, we must harness indigenous knowledge systems as we get our young people to accede to modern skills that the developing and unfolding sectors of our economy give rise to. But the indigenous knowledge systems should underpin what we do in that regard. We should use resources such as land, 
communal land should be leveraged as capital that can support investment in community development. I am pleased that the long-awaited Communal Land Administration and Tenure Summit finally took place in May of last year. The summit came after a series of consultations coordinated under the leadership of the Interministerial Committee on Land Reform chaired by Deputy President David Mabuza. Very rich discussions took place at the summit leading to insightful outcomes on the direction the country should be taking in addressing this matter. Some of the pertinent issues clearly require policy, policy interventions, and will still need to be subjected to public participation as they take shape. But what I am pleased about is that we have set up a very, very good foundation. A foundation that has identified a number of the issues on communal land that need to be taken forward. What now remains is that, that public participation. And I envisage the public participation to be the one that you as our traditional leaders, kings and queens, will lead in and will steer so that there is broad acceptance as we move towards consolidating the positions that have come through. I want to have the opportunity of hearing how best you believe this consultation process and how we move forward when I next come to the House. And therefore, without preempting the agenda of the House, this is one area that I would really like to hear more input on. The Interministerial Committee on Land Reform remains seized with the outcomes of the summit to ensure that they are indeed taken forward. And we, at the government level, will hasten this process so that we work in a connected manner. So what the House will be dealing with, we should also mirror that in the inter-ministerial committee process. The sketch of gender-based violence and femicide shows no signs of abating. As leaders, as people of standing in our communities, we all have a part to play in this. We should make it impossible for perpetrators to live, to work and socialize amongst us. We must shape the way boys and girls relate to each other. Let us nurture young men and women who see each other as equals, as partners in development and in growth. Those of us who are men ought to be found at the forefront of this fight as we confront toxic masculinity and patriarchal practices that seek to oppress and suppress women. We take this opportunity to recognize the valuable contributions of progressive men and women these include the National Men's Parliament Program, of which this House is a partner, alongside Parliament and the SANAC Men's Sector. Let us support programs of this nature to drive collective action amongst all of us against patriarchy and all that this notion of patriarchy represents. Another issue that is slowly reaching epidemic proportions is the deaths of initiates. As part of the effort to address this problem, the Customary Initiation Act came into effect in 2021. The Act aims to protect lives, it aims to set norms, 
and standards and ensure that initiation takes place in a controlled and safe environment. The 2022 summer initiation has just concluded in some of the provinces that practice summer initiation. Now, based on preliminary information, the challenges of illegal initiation schools and initiation casualties are still a huge problem. Nonetheless, there are thousands of initiates who underwent this customary rite of passage successfully and safely. Indeed, it is possible to have safe initiation practices. We congratulate the parents, initiation school principals, guardians, and those provinces that made this possible. We also congratulate provinces that took the decision or the decisive action to close down initiation schools. It is through such action and partnerships that parents and communities that we will be able to achieve safe initiation practices and the realization of the rallying call Mabaye Bepira Babuye Bepira. Let us applaud those provinces that did that. In having thought a great deal about this matter, I think all of us as leaders and as parents must be pained that when our young men go for initiation, they go there as the hope of the nation. They go there, all of us believing that they are going to now earn their right of passage into manhood and ultimately into contributors of development and leadership in our country. It pains one when we hear that they all don't come back. Most of them rather don't, some of them don't come back. And yet in other provinces, in the same country, South Africa, those who go often come back in larger numbers. This is something that we do need to pay attention to because it is a blight, it is a blight on our culture collectively, that we allow something like that to happen. And I cannot imagine the pain that parents go through when they send their young men for initiation and on return bring bo back a box. It's something that should pain all of us and it is something that we should do something about. And we need to get those provinces that have been slacking to visit those provinces that are doing well, to exchange views, thoughts, and experiences, and even go to do site visits and see exactly why others are successful and why others are not successful. I call upon you as our kings and queens and traditional leaders to embark on this as a project so that 2023 must see us having come to grips with this so that it does not occur any longer. And as to come as regards um, closing illegal initiation schools, that must be done with vigor that must be done with determination, and where it has been done, we have stopped deaths. And these are schools that we know of, because those who start these schools live amongst us. We know them. And I say to save the lives of the future of this country, it's young men, let us do precisely that. Amakosi should continue to ensure the effective implementation of the Act 
those found to be on the wrong side of the law should be dealt with and prosecuted. And we should not be lenient on this, because as I said, the lives of our sons and brothers really depend on this. And as we do this, let us think about those families that go through this pain. We have made good progress in creating a sound legal basis for the institution of traditional and Khoisan leadership to function. The traditional and Khoisan Leadership Act has now been signed into law to give effect to this provision. Government has appointed a commission on Khoisan matters and the Commission is currently receiving applications for recognition. On the 2nd of February 2022, I took a decision to establish an interministerial task team led by Deputy President Mabuza to resolve all matters raised by traditional and Khoisan leaders. It is pleasing to note that the interministerial task team's work is gaining momentum, particularly on issues relating to communal land policy, and that there has been collaboration with the communal property associations. The work streams that were established have been attending to matters around heritage promotion, and the Special Planning Land Utilization and Management Act, known as PLUMA, which has caused quite a lot of disquiet amongst our traditional leaders. Proposals on the provision of administration grants to traditional councils and the recognition of headmen and headwomen are also under the work streams that are currently underway. I must applaud Hoshi Mukwena for having taken up the cudgels and having come to the union buildings to raise these very important issues. Now, as we met, he thought I had tricked him and softened him because when he came with his delegation, it was close to lunchtime. And before we had our discussions, we had lunch. <laughs> and we had a wonderful lunch. And after that, he said, President, you are very tricky. First, you give us food, you soften us, and now we can't raise our issues as forcefully. But to his credit, Hoshi Mukwena and the Controlesa leadership gave us their own account and without pulling any punches, they detailed the issues that are of concern to our traditional leaders. They were very, very forthright. They outlined all the problems and all the challenges. And this then led to this process that I inaugurated to have the Deputy President leading a task team that has addressed this matter. Minister uh, Lamini Zuma, Deputy Minister Mbapela also got involved in this whole process. And where there has not been progress, it is not because there's been a lack of will. There has been determination to address these issues. And some of them were put as bluntly as they are. Issues of payment, yes, to headmen and headwomen. Issues of the tools of trade and issues of uh, infrastructure development and so forth. All those matters were ventilated and were dealt with frontally and thoroughly, including the land issue. It is for that reason that I'm highlighting all these matters because these matters are matters that are now through the work streams that we have. 
being attended to. And I wish to thank Deputy President David Mabuza for leading this process. Chairperson, I want to conclude by saying that our resolve in the recognition of traditional leadership in our country is irreversible. Sometimes I hear that maybe the government does not fully recognize <clears throat> our traditional leaders. I must tell you that there is no truth in that. As I travel throughout the continent, and most recently when I went to Ghana, and recognized the way in which the traditional leaders of Ghana and their government work hand in hand on a number of issues. Not that I was not convinced, but I was even much more impressed in the way that there is that cooperative working together. And the approach that they have, as I ask President of Ghana and one of the kings there, was that there is no problem without a solution. Whatever problem comes up, they always find a solution and resolve it. And this is the cooperative spirit that I believe that we should have. And from our government side and the manner in which we set out at the highest level in the presidency, supported by the ministry, to address the issues that had been raised demonstrates that, yes, we are addressing these matters. There are times as we go around provinces where provincial matters also come to the fore. And I'd like to say even there, the, the approach that we are spreading around, even at our provincial level, is that there should be that cooperation. And that approach is also descending to the local level, an area which is still a challenge for us, which I would like when I next come back to address. And I'm also delighted that you have found time to also deal on, with issues that are of concern to you on a ministerial level. Minister Aaron Mutsaledi was telling me last night that he spent time with yourselves discussing the issues of migration. Those issues of migration are topical. They're important to you because as you do your work, issues of migration come rushing towards you. You have to deal with people from other lands who are undocumented, who are illegal, and he told me that he pleaded with all of you that we should work together. So there is a lot that we should be working together on, from local government to issues of migration, issues of crime, issues of development, issues of economic development. The issues and matters that we have to work together are simply so many. And that is where we want to have a joined up government with yourselves because you are, in the end, a very important aspect of our, or layer of our government. Now, as the institution of traditional and Khoisa leadership, we regard you also as the custodians of our culture. And because you play such an important role in that space, culture in the end does not discriminate whether you are a person with disability or not, whether you are a person with albinism or not. Culture in the end does not kill whether you choose to undergo customary initiation or not. It does not lead to a disastrous end. Culture does not and should never humiliate whether you are or are part of the LGBTQI plus community or not. And culture does not promote unlawfulness. 
it certainly does not promote the abduction of young girls in the name of Ukutwana. Culture does not violate human rights just because a person is a woman in a traditional community. The institution of traditional leadership must therefore stand firm against the abuse of culture. At the same time, the institution of traditional leadership must promote and safeguard the cultural practices and advance our traditions that have held our people together over many centuries and many generations. Now, as we look to our future, I think it is important that we should remain firmly tethered to all that is noble and worthy in our past and applaud that past and promote it and spread the education about our past. We should draw on our rich history and enduring heritage as we focus on what must be done, building a better future for South Africa and indeed for all its people. I do believe and firmly believe so that traditional leaders, our kings and queens, have possibly the most important role to play in the development of our communities and country because after all, you are closest, much closest to the people of this country. And so therefore, your role is the foremost. You stand in the front line of what should happen amongst our people, development, progress, and otherwise. So I call on all of us to continue working together as we have in the past to address key challenges and make sure that we do make a success of this country. Now, some of you had sent me messages that, President, we expect the key issue, which is the pay for traditional leaders to be addressed by you. I'm not the Minister of Finance. So if you expected that, you should scrutinize the Minister of Finance budget and you will find what the Minister of Finance has said about what should happen to traditional leaders. If you want me to be the Minister of Finance, you can move emotion. Thank you very much.